so excited. I am so excited. Yeah, the last time that we... Last time we did one of these, we found out that we live in the same city, less than a mile apart. No, yeah, and it's so funny because like our faces when you're like, "Yeah, I live in uh, Spring Hill," I'm like, "I live in Spring." We're both like, "Oh my god!" <laughs> you're like Spring Hill, Florida. <laughs> yeah, like, what is happening? Yeah, crazy. So yeah, uh, and this is the first interview I've done in person in over two years. Really? Yeah. Oh my gosh, so, I feel honored. So bear with me here. Dang, dude, that's gonna be. Good luck, bro. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I brought notes this yeah. time. <laughs> so you know the drill. It's basically about you and your life and yep. your journey in music. And obviously, I want to talk about the the new record. I had a chance to hear it. It's amazing. Awesome. I'm so glad they I, sent it to you, yeah, dude. So that I'm rips. Super excited. All right, born and raised in Spokane, Washington. This couch is so comfy, dude. <laughs> you I, like it? I love yeah, it. Okay, I, I feel like you. I feel like you sit and then you kind of sink into the back of it. I love that. I love. Yeah, it's short too. So you I hate see the, the couch window. in my living room. Really? I hate it. So I, anytime <laughs> I sit on a comfortable couch, I'm always like, dude, we, we should have gotten a softer couch. Um, this was, uh, yeah, not not a whole lot of couch. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> um, okay, so. Your question was? Born and raised in Spokane, Washington. Yes, Spokane, really Washington, question. which is the first day of the next tour that we're doing with Dance Gavin Dance. Really? Yep, day one, April 26th, Spokane, Washington. Is that a big deal? Like, I know because the, the band started in Dallas, kind of, I want to get to that, but kind of you'd move there to join the band. Yeah. Is that like a huge thing for you it's, guys to play there? It's a huge thing because Spokane is, in the Pacific Northwest, if you're on a tour routing, you're usually going to hit Seattle and Portland. Uh-huh. Um, but rarely do you go to Spokane. It's just out of the way. Um, right. So unless it makes sense, you'll hardly ever end up there. Being that it's day one on this tour, our bus has like a 36-hour drive from Nashville to Spokane to start the tour. Oh, wow. Okay. And with gas prices, it's going to be awesome. <laughs> so you're driving literally from here, there? Like it's uh, The not bus like... will with the gear, with a drive uh, that oh, yeah. lengthy, like I'll, I'll fly out. But it's, okay. I mean, like usually, yeah, we would just be on for, for the long haul. Oh, my gosh. Um, but yeah, it's really cool, man. I mean, I think that the people that I grew up with... Um, having them come out and see us is, is always like an amazing time. But what's even cooler is all of the people that have moved there or were so much younger than me that I didn't know them when I lived there, like coming to the show and them not even knowing that I was like raised there and then uh-huh. being able to tell them on stage, like this is where I'm from. It's so fun. That's so cool. Um, Cause it's just an odd place to be from, you know, like mm-hmm. out of anywhere in the country when the band is from Dallas and you know, our bass players from Murfreesboro and our drummers from Orlando. It's like, I'm from Spokane and it's not <laughs> pronounced Spokane. It's pronounced Spokane. Spokane. Um, and yeah, yeah, it's just, it's really cool. And that's my favorite venue that we're playing there too. The, oh really? The Knitting Factory. Yeah. Oh, I've, well, there's a few knitting factories. There is, yeah. yeah there's, I think there's one in Boise and one in I can't uh, Reno. Maybe that's it. Yeah. I think we've played all of them. The one in Spokane is by far the best. Okay, yeah. there you go. Yeah. All right, so how did you get into music? I know your music is in your family, right? Your brother plays? Yeah, my, my brother did play. My dad played. Um, and my mom is just a music fanatic. You know, yeah. like she took us to shows religiously. Like it was more like um, music was our sports. Oh, in cool. our family, we would just we would go out and probably like every weekend, every other weekend, whether it was like something coming to the arena or something coming to like a local church or even just like uh, some sort of local band that we knew and supported. Uh-huh. You know, a lot of those like local younger bands um, we did a lot with when I was growing up, like a lot. Um, we would travel to go see them and support them however we could. And so it, that was my whole childhood was, was so music. Cool. Yeah, because. Yeah, most kids are kind of pushed into sports or mm-hmm. something like that to have yeah. music be. And my mom, you know, like she, she's, she loves sports as well. But I think that like when she saw w- what my, the trajectory of my growth was going to be, she was like, well, <laughs> that's right. not going to happen. <laughs> sure. Sure. <laughs> you know, well, well, I didn't ask uh, five, you this ten. last time though. What was the first instrument you picked up? Uh, I played guitar a little bit. I got an acoustic guitar for Christmas when I was really young and my brother played guitar, um, but never really wanted to pursue it i always just wanted to sing really yeah okay. it was like the, the the one thing that drew me to um music was just holding the microphone you know mm-hmm. and since i really do wish that i would have pursued guitar and gotten better at it and um i could play a little bit and i've got you know a handful of guitars in the studio but yeah um but i've never like 
you know, I wish that I, I, I would have really like dove into like, piano too. I wish that I would have learned piano. It's just know, such an amazing songwriting tool. But you play piano a bit, don't you? I, I was just looking at credits on some of the records and you have. Like, oh yeah. No, I there. don't. I, I literally can't play a single thing on piano. I think that our Wikipedia says that I'm vocals and keyboard for me. Yeah. On one of the records. No, <laughs> I don't know if it's on all the records, but it says yeah. that you played keyboards and I'm like, huh, that's literally rad. just, <laughs> what are you talking about? Like Wikipedia is the craziest thing that you can just literally put anything on there, but no, um, I have never done any programming or keyboards or piano for anything we've ever done that's funny yeah. i want to do a, uh, another podcast that's just all sitting down with an artist and just at, like going through the wikipedia page. yeah 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 because i've gotten burned so many times oh, just dude. going off wikipedia oh it's crazy i know and that i think that our management or our label years ago i think they submitted like a bunch of requests like maddie does not play keyboards <laughs> and whoever like put it in was like no he does to me you know and like that's... enter uh and it would just stay up so it's funny don't believe everything you read on the internet that's funny yeah so you said microphone you're always a singer uh tell me about this picture of you when you're six years old I, your brother. Yeah, so uh, my brother invited me on stage to sing with him um, when I was six. Uh, I think it was like he was in like a grunge. It was like a grunge project. I can't remember what the name of it was. Um, but there was like five lyrics. And he was like, just come up on stage and scream these over and over again. <laughs> and I just went up and grabbed the mic and I was like, ah. <laughs> um, and that was my that was how it all started. And then later... Um, there was a girl that I liked and she asked if I wanted to go to karaoke that was at a bowling alley. Oh. Do you like cosmic bowling? And then you do karaoke in the other room or whatever. And, uh, that's when like NSYNC and everything was popping. Okay. Right. And I was, I was so young and, uh, she's like, sing something. And I was like, I, I don't know. And I, gr I grabbed the mic and did like an NSYNC song and I sing it. And I was like, that felt kind of, that felt kind of good. And everyone in the room like looked over like, what? And I was like, what was that? All right. <laughs> um, and I still like to this day, I, I don't think that I necessarily enjoy my own singing voice, you right. know, like I it's it's this weird thing where um, it's something that I've done and I've done a lot. And people have been like, oh, man, this really affected me in a positive way. I'm like, OK, that's awesome. I'll keep doing it. But mm -hmm. I've never been like, wow, that sounded great <laughs> ever. You know <laughs> what I mean? So that day at karaoke was like kind of eye opening. I was like weird um, and then started bands. And, you know, my my dad's neighbor his name was, um, well, his son's name was Will and became my best friend. And we started a lot of early bands together. Um, and I'm going to go down a rabbit hole if you're here for a second. I'm here for the so rest of the day. Before we, even, <laughs> before we even started this interview today, you and I were talking about a guy named Brian Ortiz. Yes. Um, so Brian lives here and he's your friend and, and an old friend of mine. Um, he was in a band called Buddy Ruckus mm -hmm. in Spokane that me and all my friends looked up to big time. I mean, they were so rad. Um, just really cutting edge for anything that was coming out of Spokane. And uh, so my buddy Will, who lived across the street from my dad, had a band room because his dad was a musician. So we had access to everything. We had a PA and guitars, pianos, you know, like microphones, anything that you could need just to jam as a child. Like we had it, um, cool. which was insane. You and could um, what as loud as you wanted in there? Or? Yeah, we could, oh dude, it was a separate building built onto the back of the house that was specifically for music, and I was just like, and I mean, you know, like looking back, it wasn't like it was like state of the art, but it had everything, right? right. Like, and you just go in and you'd grab an SM58, and you had no idea that it cost a hundred dollars. <laughs> You're just like, throwing it around, and <laughs> well, um, to be fair, you could like hammer a nail in. With you those really mics can. And still work. Yeah, you really can. Um, but yeah, so um, when Buddy Ruckus. Um, when they decided to break up, their yeah. bass player, um, his name was Steve Westcott. Me and Will invited him to join our band. Oh. And he's significantly older than us. So we were just like, there's no way he's going to say yes. And he did. Um, right. And he brought a new drummer with him. And that was, that was my very first real band ever. I was probably 14 or 15 years old and overnight um, was playing with some of the most like well-respected rock musicians in Spokane where wow. I'm from and it happened I mean it happened fast I had to grow up like really fast uh -huh. they were like you guys want a tour and I was like uh I gotta ask my mom like <laughs> for right. real I, I actually, how old were you in this like was... 14 15 I was like I really gotta ask my mom and the van would pull up outside of the house and my mom would go up to the driver's seat and talk to Steve and she'd just be like I swear on my life if you if anything happens to my son <laughs> and uh and we would go we would just drive we would drive to Portland we would drive to the Tri-Cities we would drive to Salt Lake City and we would play shows for whoever would listen. And we built up a pretty decent following in Spokane, where we were from. It was really cool. And just throughout the Northwest and met a lot of awesome people. And, um, yeah, 
yeah, wild, wild story. That's that's kind of how it all began. Oh wow! And when before you know their bass player and drummer joined the band, who was playing? What were you just singing? I was singing. Will was playing guitar. We had a buddy from high school that was playing drums, and another buddy. Well, another guy from my high school that I didn't really know that was playing bass, but he only owned an acoustic bass. So like uh, okay. we would be jamming, and he'd just be like, <laughs> <laughs> I was like, all right. Um, but yeah, it was. Uh, it was it was a it was a pretty strange lineup at first when Steve came and brought the other Steve who was actually not in Buddy Ruckus but just a friend of his that was a drummer. Um, everything was like, I mean, we started like we bought a trailer and just, I it was so I was so young and it was so fast for it to happen uh-huh. like that. Um, and it was cool. I think some of my favorite times in music ever. Wow, you know? that's yeah. a, that's so incredible. So this band is this Knights and Fire that you're t- that you're talking about? Nope. Okay. Um, the first. The first band name we had was, I always mix them up. I can't remember what was first and what was second, but I think we started as Eloy. Okay. Um, and, which is E L O I. And then we became the Monroe. The Monroe. Yeah. Um, and you were touring with, that was the band you started touring with. Yeah. Oh yeah. my God. Yeah, dude. I mean, we would go to like, we would drive nine hours to Portland to play in a coffee shop um, for seven people. That's so you know, nice. like, and just kept doing that. And the scene started to kind of pop and, uh, and we were on kind of, kind of riding that wave, uh-huh. like all the local scene in Portland and local scene in Spokane and everything. And I mean, like we had great shows, like after a, about a year of doing it, you know, like we did a battle of the bands in Spokane and won the whole thing. It's called Bob Fest. And we were like front page of the newspaper and wow. all this stuff. And it's like, it was, it was wild. It was wild. I have a lot. I have, I have a lot, um, of just respect and love for, for Brian Ortiz, for Steve Westcott, for Steve Turner, um, you know, for Christian Hendricks, for these guys from Spokane that took a chance to play music with this little ginger kid, you know, <laughs> changed, changed the course of my life. So. That's so amazing. Well, okay. Was the next band then Nights and Fire? I want to talk about that band real quick. Yeah. When the Monroe started to come to an end, um, I've never talked about any of this in an interview. It's so funny because I've always been like, I don't want anybody to know what the bands were called because they're funny. Uh, Those are good names. Yeah, they're yeah. Horrible. Well, the music was just, yeah. I'm, I'm stoked to talk about it. Let's do it. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, the next band was Nights and Fire. Nights as in like nighttime, not um, not like a night, uh, like on a horse. Okay. Uh, but we... Uh, the the Monroe there was some like internal stuff people were like talking about having kids getting married stuff like that which is funny because I was only like you know 17 16 <laughs> uh but but there was older guys in the band sure. right um and I had decided to start another band with another guy um a couple other friends that that I had not played music with yet and we decided um we were we were jamming in a in a postage meter storage facility um, which is crazy. Um, and we were like, what if, you know, like what the guy I was jamming with was like, what about this riff? And it was like a lot heavier than anything we'd ever done before. And, um, so before that, before we were called Nights and Fire, we we're called Fever Fever. I know there's another band called Fever Fever now, but this was like forever ago when there right. was no Fever Fever. And you couldn't find like any band on Spotify. No, right. Exactly. <laughs> um, this is a long time ago. And then he wrote this riff and brought the table and he's like, can you scream? And I was like, I don't know. Like, let's, uh let's try it. So, so I did. So I was like, "Ah!" (laughs) you know, (laughs) just thrash my vocal cords. And, um, I was like, but this feels, this feels cool. This is right when like showbread was coming through town and, um, you know, like all the tooth and nail solid state era Mm -hmm. that was just explosive was happening. And we were like, we could do this. And so we just honed in on that and we made a record and, um, what was the record called? Uh, dark and desperate times. Is what it was called. That's and, a good uh, name. Yeah, we did it with uh, with my producer uh, in town. His name was Joe Varela, who was like the biggest sweetheart, um, who actually recorded my audition for Memphis as well. Okay. Um, but yeah, yeah we did we, we did that record, and we went and played some shows around town, and and then um, my buddy uh, Ryan Folden, who it was most recently the drummer for the band Lacuna Coil, mm-hmm. he's from Spokane, um, and my buddy Scoop Roberts, um, who had played for a lot of different bands and, um, they had done some traveling and they came back and I was in nights and fire and we had actually just recruited, um, a guy in Spokane to be in the band. His name was George Silva. And, uh, he was just a local legend, you know, Mm -hmm. still is a a local legend in Spokane for music. He was in a band called five foot thick. That was a really big deal back in the day. And, um, he had agreed to join nights and fire and he was with us for probably six months or so. We did a bunch of shows. Um, 
and Scoop and, and Ryan went and did some traveling. Uh, Ryan was touring with Papa Roach, doing some stuff, and they came back. Real quick on that. Wasn't yeah. he, like, babysitting for Jacoby? Yes. <laughs> Ryan, and I, I told you about this in the last interview. Just the one little piece of it. Yeah. I just thought that was interesting. Ryan Fulton, he was babysitting for, for the Shaddixes. Yeah. <laughs> That's so cool. <laughs> Crazy. Um, but they came back, and... Um, they were like, hey, Matt, we need to take you out for lunch, Scoop and, and Ryan, or Scoop and Blaze, depending on how you know them. Okay, I have, an, I have a follow-up question on this, too. Yeah. So, what, they call you and say, hey, Matt, uh, we, we need to take you out to lunch. Yeah. And that was, the, that was how the, the question was, fra- like, phrased? Like yeah, that? like, we need to talk to you. Was that, like, terrifying? To- me, I'd be like, uh-oh. Like, what I did mean, I do? I mean, back then, there wasn't like- so much anxiety in life. It was just, like, they were, like, it was just more, like, exciting, you know, there's a Taco Bell in town now, you know, but could, still, could have like, been the news. If I get a text from somebody and it's like, we need to talk. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it wasn't like that. Like, okay. I think there was maybe, some, it's been so long. It was like, just some more details. Like, hey, we need to talk to you about about something, an opportunity or whatever. Oh, okay. So they um, phrased it a little less. I don't, I don't remember exactly, but. But that was what I was thinking when, it, when yeah, you said that last we, time. I was we like, went oh, to I a place called a Monterey Pizza. Okay. Um, and sat down and they were like, Matt, they're like, we have been out and we've seen the whole country. This is before I had done hardly any traveling at all. Mm -hmm. And uh, like just outside of the the Pacific Northwest. And they were like, what we have here in Spokane is cool. um, But it's not anything like what's going on out in like major cities. Mm -hmm. And if you want to succeed, you're going to have to spread your wings and fly um, because there's so much else. There's so much more to see and to taste and to do. And, and when a band comes through and they're selling a thousand tickets, you're like, Oh, that's cool. I wonder how that happened. But you go out and you see how it happens. And it's every single day you're grinding and you're going to major cities and you're playing and you're performing as much as you possibly can and getting on tour with bands. And, and in, in Spokane at that time, it was like, there just wasn't enough happening for the city to, to go out. There's one other band called Coretta Scott that had gone out and done some cool stuff. But I mean, like they were an anomaly, right? Okay. Yeah. Um, and they were like, there's this band called Memphis may fire. Some girl that scoop was, uh, dating dated one of the guys in the band at the time or something like that. And had told him that they were doing op- open vocal auditions. Mm-hmm. And, um, by the time I had gone on to see it, I mean, it was basically, they uploaded a song to MySpace, a, an instrumental to MySpace, mm-hmm. and anybody could download it, record vocals over it, and send it in, and, and then they would, like, pick somebody, right? And they had done, like, gotten, God knows how many, 880 or something like that wow. at that time. I mean, they were listening to all of these. Yeah, Kellen would okay. just get him in his email, and, I mean, there's That's a lot impressive. of other, like, notable singers who I won't mention, <laughs> um, because I don't know if they would want to, to people to know or whatever, but know a lot of other guys them. from other, like, <laughs> bands that have become very successful that had auditioned for this at this time, and I had no clue what I was doing. Uh-huh. The instrumental was called Decade. Um, I was like, okay, you know, I took it. I went out, and I had a, a band meeting with the guys in my current band, and I was like, I don't know if I'm going to be around very long, I'm going to try this out. And if it works, I think I have to do this for, for my career. I have to do this for my family. Mm-hmm. It's so crazy to look back on that moment. Cause it was so like massively like dramatic and, and it should have been, and it, it, because of how things worked out, but blah, blah. Um, so I did it. I went in with Joe Varela. I wrote and recorded some vocals, sent them to Kellen mm-hmm. and he emailed me back immediately. And he was just like, Hey, um, do you want to jam? And I was like, yeah. And he's like, all right, can you come to Texas? And I'm like, I don't have any money. And they're like, we'll see if our management can afford to fly you out. But I mean, like a $200 plane ticket was like budget crushing back then. Right. right? But they did. So their Um, management ended up getting you the ticket. Yeah. The management ended up doing it. Um, they had, a in their dad's, in Kellen's dad's living room, which had a bunch of plants and stuff in it. They had all their gear set up. I, I literally walked in, met them for the first time. And we went into the living room and they just started playing one of their songs and they were like, sing. And I was like, okay. So did you like, what, cause they had an EP out, right? They time? had an EP out, which was like, so, so unlike me, you know, okay. like the, the singer that was on that EP was, couldn't have been more wildly different <laughs> okay. than me. So I was trying to emulate him and he's very like Southern Texas kid. I'm from the Pacific Northwest. Right, I was right. like. But did uh, you know, did you, they send you the EP and they're like, okay, listen to this. No, I, I, they songs. didn't, they didn't really give me direction on that, but I just did. I just okay. went ahead and jammed it a bunch, especially like getting to learn the band and everything. Mm-hmm. Um, and so we did that. Um, I, I flew to Texas. I jammed in their living room and in, in Kellen's dad's living room. And then like literally minutes after 
we finished, I think maybe the second song, he was like, all right, if you wanted, it's yours first shows in a couple months. And Whoa. I was like, uh, so, and I was, I mean, 19, newly married, had just only yeah. been married for like a year. Um, I called my wife. I was like, we got to figure a lot of stuff out. So, um, I flew back, we packed up everything. My wife transferred jobs to, um, to Texas and we drove a forerunner towing U-Haul all the way down to Dallas and just uprooted our entire lives overnight to get there. Um, wow. to, to essentially, um, to, to make no money at all. You know, like for the first five years that I was in the band, like we were just grinding. We'd live on $5 a day. And when I'd come home from tour, I was working, I would get, I'd go in and get a part-time job at Hot Topic. And it was really easy because they were selling Memphis Mayfire shirts on the That's wall. That's sick. So I would literally go in and I'd be like, I'll sell. And I would just, you know, people would come in. They're like, aren't you? And I'm like, yeah, dude, like we're broke. <laughs> um, and, uh, and That's yeah, we so just, funny. yeah, it was crazy, crazy time, dude. Um, just that, endless effort from everybody that's, I mean, even guys that aren't in the band anymore that were there just like busting, you know, like, and obviously Jake, Kellen and Corey, it's like, nobody has any idea what we've been through, dude. Mm -hmm. Nobody has any idea the years and, and just like the hardest moments and tragedies and things that we've all like just gone through together and, and stuck through to get to where we're at now. Yeah. So I mean, to call your wife up, I mean, Call Brittany up mm -hmm. and say, "Hey, they're offering me this gig for this band. You guys were on Trust Kill at the time, right? Trust Kill. Yep. And I mean, I, people may assume like, oh, you're signed to a label, like you're loaded, right? Like, yeah. you, this, which is so like, it's crazy to think. I I interviewed this yeah. band Ann Arbor, who were from uh, Phoenix, and I think they were signed to like a pretty big indie label and they had like a video on mtv two or something back in the day yeah. and the guy came in they they have a new guitar player now this is kind of a rant story but he came in to like GameStop, and the new guy who plays guitar with him now is working there and he's yeah. like oh my gosh like blah 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 and he's like yeah are you guys hiring <laughs> like Dude. we're not on the road but that's you know, how it goes it's crazy that's how it goes man i mean like i worked at guitar center for a little while um kellen was working at sam's club um I don't remember where Corey was working. Um, but it's not like you guys are... Yeah. It wasn't music full-time yet. No, not, not at all. I mean, like, it was... Even even though, you know, like, we would take any tour opportunity we could get, it's mm -hmm. like we still came home, and it's like, okay, well, now I got to make some money to make up for that money I didn't make, right? Right. Because you're right. out living on $5 a day and just getting enough gas money to get to the next show and trying and trying and trying and trying and trying and... um. There's a lot of people that respect our first record, which is awesome. You know, it's called Sleepwalking. And mm -hmm. to some people, it's their favorite record, which is so cool because I was just learning. I was figuring out who I was at that time. Um, but nothing felt official until The Center came out. Okay. When The Center came out, it was like that song, that video. It's like everybody all at the same time was like, okay, we'll take you seriously. Okay. And it but was, that was not for another a, record and an EP, while. right? Yeah, it was a while. A while later, we did we did the, the full length and we did the EP to get off of Trust Kill, um, and then unsigned went to Florida to start working on a new record. And the first song that we did, uh, maybe maybe second or third song, but the first song that we had finished, we started sending it around, shopping it to labels, and a few of them were just like, "Nah, this band's dead in the water," you know, like it's yeah. not gonna happen. And then as soon as we signed to Rise and and put that song out, it's like everything changed. Mm -hmm. It was really, it was really fast, too fast to even really grasp okay. what was happening. Cause yeah. we were still playing in 300 cap rooms, but then all of a sudden the next record came out and we were top, top of the billboard and like all this stuff. Yeah. And it was like, you couldn't even really taste it. It was just too fast. Wow. You know? Well, I want to, I'm, I got a couple questions on, yeah. so you are in the band, then they have a record done, right? Uh -huh. With no vocals. Right. And you have to go, and record vocals on this record. Not only that, like, I mean, you just kind of joined the band. Yeah. Now you got to write lyrics, everything to it with a band you hadn't played in. Yeah. And then everything was kind of in shambles with the label and management and all that, right? At the time? It was insane. Yeah, it was insane. I mean, like, the producer wouldn't bounce um, the songs for us at the end of the day to listen to because he hadn't been paid yet by the label really like the deposit so he was like sorry guys i can't like i can't get stiffed so we would like track all day and then we couldn't listen to it um and yeah dude just a, it was such a crazy time 
Like I know be, being in Seattle, it was funny because the record was being done in Seattle. So like I w- went, came from the Northwest, moved to Dallas. We geared up, flew out to Seattle and started <laughs> working on a record out there. And I had buddies from Spokane kind of come by the studio and I'm just like, you guys got to hear this. I was so stoked, man. It was just so, it was so next level and so fun. Casey Bates is who did that record. And he's had like an insane amount of success since then as a producer doing like all sorts of cool stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, But he was like the first real, like it was the first real studio I'd ever even been in first, like real vocal producer I'd ever worked with. And he was like, just really encouraged me to, to be fully emotional and not be so critical of myself, which was transformed me in a lot of ways. Yeah. I would imagine that being very hard to go in there. Super with, hard. Yeah. Yeah. Right, lyrics that you said the other singer was not anything He's like nothing what, like me. Yeah. All the respect in the world. But I mean, nothing at all like people. me. Yeah. 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 And then now they have a fan base. I mean, they're on a label. Right. Yeah. And they had enough buzz that people are yep. 180 people are sending auditions to this band. Yeah. You get in the band. Not only do you have to kind of probably come out and prove yourself to their fan base, but. You're gonna put your voice on a, on a record. To my first show with them was like thousands of people in Dallas. It was a festival um, that Mike Zemer had put on at the Plano Center. The very first time I ever performed with the band, I think it was like six thousand tickets sold. Oh wow! So I was just was like, that rough. I well, mean, no, I was uh, I was so ignorant to just everything that I was just like, here we go. You know, like it's just like this is how it is down here. You know, like and just went up and yeah, crazy man. Oh my gosh. Okay, so then. You put out the EP after that, and I remember last time you talked, you said that's kind of where you fell in. You felt like you found mm-hmm. yourself in the band. That's that's definitely when I was able to start being myself um, behind a microphone. You know, like I was for the first record, I was just like, all right, let's really stay true to this ba- this band's you know like thing that they had, and tried to do it, and ended up being a lot more like me than what they were doing previously, anyways. And then by the time we got to that, I was like, all right, this is this is where I can start to just be myself, you Mm -hmm. know, Matt Mullins from Spokane, Washington. And I did. And, and then there was a good amount of buzz behind that just locally and everything. And that was really the, the leeway into the hollow, you know, that, that EP gave me the confidence and the understanding of who I was enough to go in and and make the hollow what it was. And you guys gave that EP, you said it was kind of like a deal with trust Mm killed. Here you go. Now we're out. And you get, uh, approached by a producer in Orlando that says, yep. I'm going to do this next record pro bono. Right? Pro bono. Yeah. So yeah. Kellen that? actually had reached out to him and said, we have no money. We have no deal, uh-huh. but I believe in us. Will you help? And he was like, yeah. Um, so, you know, we went down to Orlando and just started doing it. I don't even know. I don't, I honestly, like we lived at the studio, which was in a storage unit, sleeping on the floor, essentially. Um, I slept in the vocal booth. <laughs> and yeah, you said there's a brown recluse in there. Right? Oh yeah, oh, dude, <laughs> endless, endless brown recluses. Um, but no, it was just it was. Uh, I don't even know how we were eating or anything. Like I don't know. I can't remember how we had any money to do whatever. I I don't know. Maybe I was borrowing money from my dad or something back then. But we literally had nothing. Like we were literally just in Florida, seeing all these crazy like love bugs for the first time. Like this is wild, you know. Like uh, making a record and getting to know the dynamic of Karen Mizell, who was doing that record. It was just such a, man, it was such a special time. It was so wild and so free and so unassuming, like nothing that was happening you would think was going to happen. And then it did. It was just the way that the songs were coming together. Um, some of the opportunities that kind of fell into our plate, the labels that were looking at us, the labels that were like, no way. And the labels that were like, sure. It was just like a lot going on. And, um, and yeah, there was a cockroach that fell from the ceiling <laughs> while I was peeing um, one day and it was huge. I was peeing and it just goes, <laughs> just <laughs> fell right next to me. And I was like, ah! um, looking back on that, I can't believe we slept in there. There was actually a homeless guy in the rafters. This is a true I have, story. I have a question. I'll, I'm glad you're telling this. Okay. okay. I was um, going to go here. Yeah. So you, I've already told you <laughs> no, this. No, 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 no. Go okay. Ahead. So there was a, there was a, in the control room, there was a, a TV that had four cameras and uh, the camera for the vocal booth, the um, camera for like the live room or something, 
and the camera for where like storage and live room kind of like met together. And Cameron was like, dude, I always, he's like, I must be seeing things. Like I'll just be working and I'll see something kind of move by the camera. And I was, he's like, maybe it's haunted. And I'm like, I don't believe in that. Um, let's just keep working. Whatever. Right, right. And, uh, there was one day that like Cameron went in there and heard some rustling and like a, a can like fell from the ceiling or whatever. And he went up there and there's literally like two homeless people sleeping in the rafters where they like, kept all the drum sets and everything oh like my everything was just in there you know and um he said that they were like urinating on the ground up there and like all sorts of stuff dude this was a wild place how do you get them out you just go uh i luckily i wasn't present for that <laughs> okay. i would just i would have probably <laughs> sprinted i was like yeah, yeah i'd be freaked what is out. going on yeah it's crazy squatters is what they call them dude okay yeah so they you guys got them out and this is still on the the hollow record this was, no, I think this was in between the hollow and challenger when you, Jake was still engineering for Cameron there. Okay. Um, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> With, but you guys got signed to rise, what, a couple songs into the recording? Yeah, yeah, we were only okay. ha like not even halfway done with the record um, when it was being shopped and they were like, we'll finish this with you for sure. Um, and I think we signed for like, you know, four albums or something crazy like right in a moment you have no idea you're like the next eight years of my life here you go yeah um, what's well, rise record yeah it was it, at that time it was there was no comparison right. right it was rise and so we did we signed and it was uh it was literally like a week later like everything was done like we were on rise and they started like uploading stuff about us and put us on the website and everything it just yeah was that like totally life-changing at that yeah point? i mean i mean like you know like confidence wise right for sure it's not like we like made any money yeah or, like you know what i mean like, like, or no <laughs> you know like they, they paid they paid for the record and we shot some music videos and stuff like that um but it was definitely like a confidence booster it was mm -hmm. like okay we we've got this you know that when, when i joined the band it was after the band had already had a little bit of hype and so the manager of the band dropped the band um you know the booking agent had dropped the band mm -hmm. just like this isn't going to work with the second singer and so Getting to that point where, you know, we'd signed. Um, yeah, it yeah. was. And they put out the center as the single. And yeah, that was took off. Yeah. And it kind of felt like because I was, you know, observing Rise and how well they were doing, it kind of felt like, oh, well, there's this many views on this song. Like, that's just what happens when you put a song out on a Rise YouTube channel, uh -huh. which to, to an extent is true because they had a killer following of people that were just watching whatever they were putting out. Um, but it, there was like a real, there was a real energy behind it. There was mm -hmm. a real buzz. There was a real like nationwide, worldwide buzz around this like song. Mm -hmm. And we didn't have any idea. We Did didn't that... have any idea until it was just like, oh my gosh, here we are in Bangkok. Here we are in Bangkok, you know, like here we are in Belarus, you know, here we are like in Monterey, like what, what is happening right now? You know, so you like, hadn't left the country on a tour. Until no. Then? And then we played like Japan and like every, we went everywhere. It was oh crazy. Wild times. Yeah. And then the challenger comes out. That's the next record. Yeah. And is this the one? Oh no, it was the next record. But tell me about the Challenger. You you, record, you recorded that one in the same spot, and this is when Challenger we did back with with Cameron there, um, and Unconditional. But between those two records, uh, Cameron had moved um, from or Orlando to Phoenix, and so we did that record in Phoenix. Okay. Um, but you did say last time we spoke that that was the record that kind of solidified you guys as a band. Challenger. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Like the the Hollow gave us a start, so everyone would kind of pay attention. Mm -hmm. challenger was the record where everyone's like okay mm -hmm. like they're here you know okay. like it's it's actually a real thing it's not a it's not gonna it's not just like a flash in the pan right um it, it charts on billboard again mm -hmm. and does this i mean having the hollow then you follow it up i mean that must have been the biggest scare right yeah totally totally um because we didn't know i mean like it was we were still riding the wave and touring as much as we could and just trying to wrap our heads around, you know, what was going on. And so going back in to do that record, it's like, can we beat it? <laughs> right. You know? And then you beat it again. Yeah. On the next record. Yeah, I, I think so. Um, well, the charts. Said so. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the charts. <laughs> charts. Charts, yeah. And uh, you you asked, uh, this is a great story, and, and I don't know if you told it fully last time, but about how do, like, we get out of this van, right? Mm -hmm. Wasn't it, like the unconditional is coming out and you're like said something to your manager like how do we get out of the van we like yeah. to the next level like what's the next thing like a bus yeah my my manager had told me he was like 
10K plus equals bus. Like if we sold 10,000 <laughs> copies or more first week, um, then we would, then we could get a bus. And that was like such a false equation. I mean, he was just trying to figure out a way to like get me stoked because we had been sleeping in a van without air conditioning for however long and transmissions blowing out and getting stuck in Las Cruces, New Mexico. And like, it was crazy. I mean, for years, right? Mm -hmm. We did it for years. And um, he was like 10K plus equals bus or whatever. And then <laughs> we were on Warp Tour and he comes busting in and he's just like, this is the number. And I can't even remember what it was, but it was way beyond what we had thought it was going to be. And I was just like, here we go. That's so cool. Yeah. And then, I mean, it was just like days later that Rise showed up with our plaques and gave them to us. And then all of a sudden the plaques just kept coming and we were just kind of like unwrapping them and sticking them wherever we could to try to like, you know, not, that sounds really crazy. It's not like post Malone. Right. It's like, but, but I mean yeah. like there was like four in a very short period of time where uh -huh. you were just like, what do I do with this? You know what I mean? And, and it was, uh, it was a wild thing. And, and then I was like, man, this is, this is what it's like. And then, you know, like, it's, I didn't know it was like not always going to be like that. Record sales are totally different now. Oh yeah. Streaming and, and all of that, you know, I, I took it for granted at the time, but I don't anymore. You know, I definitely mm -hmm. look back and I'm like, I mean, wow. Opening a plaque with seeing your yeah. name on it. Like that's so crazy. Super cool. Oh, now you have this plaque to kind of yeah, it was validate crazy. everything. Validate for sure. Yeah. Validate for sure. Um, just, you just don't know. I wish that you could really kind of taste and smell and touch everything in a moment but it's never until like hindsight's 2020 you know like right. never until you get to another point where you're like oh wow you know it's hard to be really grateful for everything when everything's chaotic and you feel like you're so much is expected of you mm -hmm. um but yeah i don't know man crazy that is what what record was it or at what point were you off the five dollar a day budget and quitting I, hot topic and yeah <laughs> <laughs> i think that um on our tour with i think it was called the all-stars tour um i mean it was a million bands it was like alice anna and namur and uh, i think like a skylet drive sleeping with sirens us oh, wow. attila like it was like a big like thing or whatever. I think on that tour we bumped our PDMs out to ten bucks a day. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and then I think we even got to a point on like a warp tour or something where we had like fifteen dollar PDMs, but then there was catering every day, so no one knew how to spend their money, and they were like, "Dude." So we just all like had these like you know wads of like may maybe a hundred bucks <laughs> in cash like by the end of like a month. And just like this is crazy. Let's go to the mall, you know. That's so um, funny. Yeah. So. And we were on a bus on our first warp tour, but that's like kind of a given. Some bands do it in a van. It's like, God bless it. That's the most insane thing. It's yeah. such a hot and grueling tour with no real indoor facilities. So we did bus it on, on that. That was our first bus ever was, was that first warp tour we did in 2012. And we shared it, mm -hmm. shared the bus with Born of Osiris. And that was wild. Oh, really? It was a wild time. <laughs> Those guys are crazy. I, I know. Mean, I their love music them. is insane. Dude, like, I love them. They're still some of the funniest guys I've ever met in my entire life, dude. Ronnie and Cameron. I mean, just like, you should follow those guys on Instagram. <laughs> they're, st they're still like some, I, I pass around memes they share like all the time, but that's cool. Yeah. We didn't talk much about this record last time, The Light I Hold. Um, I know Larry of um, no way out. I'm just gonna drop that. Let's one. go, dude. <laughs> yeah, was on the record. Yeah, like, tell me about tell me about that album because, like I said, we didn't really talk about it. Yeah. Um. So we did that record in Phoenix with Matt Good. Um. I, I think I went into that record with a mindset, kind of a confused mindset, and I wish that I would have been more clear in my head. Like I look back, and I'm happy with how the record turned out. Um. But it could have been so much better had I just kind of had my head wrapped around things the way that, that I do now, right? Mm -hmm. As far as just like the, the perspective of how the song is being written. So anyways, um, we were there and it was like a struggle. I, I, I was there for probably a month, left, came back for like another probably 15 days, something like that. We spent a lot of time on it. Um, but when the record was done, I was like, okay, we've got something here. And um, I had... Larry from My American Heart, Stu Guest Vocals on that record, which he's like one of my favorites of all time. Mm -hmm. And then Jacoby from Papa Roach um, on that record too, which was just insane. He like flew out to Phoenix. I picked him up at the airport, brought him to the studio. He had a flight like that night or whatever, just came in and crushed it. One of the most talented 
live and studio vocalist mm-hmm. I've ever heard in my life, dude. He is, he whatever you think Jacoby is, he is in, in real life, right? Like it's nuts. Um, and so he killed it. And uh, I mean, we had like four hours to spare. He just booked a, a different flight home, like literally flew in, picked him up, killed it, got to chat, hang out for a while, drove him back to the airport. It was all happened within like three hours. So Did crazy. you know him prior to that? Had you ever met him? Um, we had presented an award together at an award show called The Golden Gods. Hmm. And he was like, hey, do you know who I am? And I was like, yeah. And he's <laughs> like, well, I know who you are, man. I got a lot of respect for what you're doing. God bless. And I was just like, wow. I looked at Kellen because Kellen was there. I was like, did that just really happen? Um, so yeah, it was special. It was really special, man. His energy... And his little, you know, his little brother, uh, you know, Bryson, who we've brought out on tour to to do like documenting and things mm-hmm. like that. Their family and and their family dynamic is so special. And so getting to know Kobe from doing that song together was awesome. And then he flew out to L.A. We did the music video together, which was crazy. Mm-hmm. And then we just, you know, we went out. We've always wanted to tour Papa Roach, and we just did. Yeah. This, this last year, we went out in stadiums. Um, yeah, in in arenas, and did that with Breaking Benjamin and Papa Roach. It was so cool to see them. I genuinely believe that Papa Roach is at the top of their career right now, Mm -hmm. period. Like they are, you know, like Last Resort is such a cool song for what it is and what it's done for them. But if that's all that you've paid attention to, you are missing out. Right. In wild ways. Mm -hmm. I mean, their newest stuff is insane. And Jacoby is just as energetic and lively of a front man as he's ever been. Mm-hmm. The whole band, Jerry. Jerry looks younger, which is annoying. <laughs> I, every, I, every time I saw him, I was like, dude, you, do you have Benjamin Buttons? Yeah, I was going to say, he's like Brad Pitt. Like, what is going on, <laughs> dude? Like, literally, if you look at Papa Roach photos from, like, the 90s, and then you look at, or, like, early 2000s, whatever, and then you look at, like, a, a Papa Roach promo now, he looks better. <laughs> and you're just like, what are you drinking, dog? Because yeah, I want some of it. Exactly. Um, yeah, but no, it was really cool. But you were a big fan of My American Heart, weren't you? Huge They're a San fan. Diego band. That's the only reason. Huge I... fan, huge fan, and and to the point where I mean, like, I used to tweet at Larry back when like I was doing the Twitter thing a lot, and I would just be like, "Please come to our show <laughs> in San Diego." Anytime we were coming to San Diego, that's all I could think about. Uh-huh. And one time, he, I think he was just like, "Man, this fan is annoying," you know. <laughs> and one time he came out, and uh, by that time we were on a bus, and he came out, and we were just like hanging out, and. He was so kind and genuine and special. And we sat in the front lounge of the bus and sang My American Heart songs this close to each other's faces for the entire night. <laughs> like four hours. That's amazing. Dude, it was like one of the most amazing nights of my entire life. My band would just kind of walk in and out of the bus like, oh my gosh. And me and Larry were just like, ah. And we just like, we loved each other instantly. We became brothers. And, you know, like I went to the 10-year shows and I got to sing with them at one of the 10-year shows. And he came down and stayed at my house, you know, before the pandemic and just, we've developed like a really special relationship, Jesse too. And, and Dustin who played bass for the place for Dan and Shay, Yeah, you know, and, and he's, he's a good friend of mine too. And just such a, such a sweetheart. So, um, a lot, a lot of like, you know, music, like benefit and relational benefit has come out of that band and the mm-hmm. people that were in that band in my life, you know? Yeah. I remember when they were no way out and they started to get really big and I was like, so sick. Like, who are these kids? Cause yeah. they were younger than me. And I'm like, uh, yeah, yeah. And I'm like, what is happening? And then they just started to skyrocket. Yeah. And then I think they got signed. That's why they changed their name. Ernie ball. Yeah. yeah. They signed Ernie ball records, um, which was like a Kevin Lyman thing. Um, yeah, the, my American heart and the records that they put out, you know, H- hiding inside the horrible weather and the meaning and makeup, two of the most underrated mm-hmm. records from the scene ever. Yeah. Like if you know acceptance, but don't know my American heart, you missed out <laughs> on a big part of your childhood. Sure. You know, if yeah. you know Paramore, but don't know my American heart, you missed out on some of the greatest records ever made. Mm-hmm. And I'm dead serious. Yeah, I completely agree. Yeah. They were such a great band. Such and a great to band. See them. I mean, San Diego got quite a few bands out of that scene yeah. i mean with pierce the veil and then uh nick martin's and yeah uh, he was in a band called undermined totally for a undermined, while. Yeah. and yeah, yeah it was cool to see kind of those bands just make it out of san diego yeah before yeah. i mean it was blink was the deal and the uh, pod came of out course. of there switchfoot but like these bands from this scene yeah that were making it out lower just, definition oh yeah lower definition and then you know tino he's in uh of mice Oh yeah, yeah, yeah! It's crazy, it's wild, man. wild, wild. Cool scene. Um, so tell me, the Broken was the next record you guys did before the pandemic, right? And yeah, you had a couple radio plays, which was yeah, we had cool. a couple songs on the record that went to radio, which was a huge blessing. We had gone in with a different producer, like a rock producer that mm-hmm. we had never worked with before. 
um, and didn't know. You know, we had done a single with him to like try it out or whatever. And we we're like, okay, well, let's let's go make a Memphis Mayfire rock record. Mm-hmm. And we didn't know what we were doing or what we were getting ourselves into. And the biggest thing that we learned through the process was that we've always been good at making records in our bedrooms <laughs> and we should do that. Okay. We should do that. You know, like we don't need to go and be fancy. Our band mm. doesn't need to be fancy. Um, Kellen is brilliant uh-huh. and f- far more than capable of, you know, um, anything that we need. And I think you get in your head and you hear all these voices and you're like, we got to go and do this and do that and work with this guy and, and all that. And all that stuff is cool. And it, and it's something that I think every band should do at some point. Um, but we really, I think learned that, who we are is a band that has this energy, this connection with our fans. And the further that we get away from what originally created that connection with our fans, the more that we lose touch, Mm -hmm. you know, like blood and water was the first song that we had put out that felt like fans had really, they were just like, Oh my God, I've been waiting for this moment from Memphis Mayfire. And it's like, well, I recorded the vocals in my house and Kellen recorded everything else at his house. Like, Huh. Huh. You know? Yeah. Weird. You know? We didn't go to Vegas and spend yeah. unbelievable amounts of money on this. Like, we did a record in our bedrooms. I was just like, I think that this means something, you know? I think it means, like, what it was that gave us the angst that we had as, you know, like, as a young band and and how we had to do things a certain way because we didn't have any other choice. It gave us something that our fans felt. Mm-hmm. And we rediscovered that with this new record. The record is amazing. Like Thanks. I said earlier, I had a chance to hear it. And I definitely hear the kind of coming back to the hollow and yeah, those earlier totally. records in it. And my favorite song on the album is the last one. The really? Fight Within. I love that song. Oh, man, that gets me so stoked. Really? I, yeah. I think that song is so good. Thank you, dude. And I mean, the whole album's good. Don't get me wrong. Yeah. Uh, you guys have put out, I think, only three you have three songs that haven't came out yet i think from what i was going yeah we through. just put out only human yeah and you have a guest vocals uh-huh. on that aj one. yeah he's yeah. killer dude it's such a good voice um yeah and and yeah so there should be three, three other your turn there should be three i'll more. just drop them all your turn misery yep. <laughs> yep. yeah so i think misery and i love that one too that's on my notes the yeah. breakdowns are yeah. so sick. <laughs> Thanks, dude. Um, that's what the, that's the song that the album was named after. You yeah, know? Um, remade in misery remade is the misery. record. Yeah, and did you see that? Um, who is it? Silverstein's new album is called Misery Made Me. No, and I was like, no way, that's crazy. It's not. I mean, <laughs> I, I'm totally. It's awesome to me because it, you know, like they announced theirs. It was just like a week after we announced ours or something like that. Uh-huh. And we toured with those guys and their sweethearts and everything. And I was like, that's it's to some people it's like the internet will take it as like a chance to like go and like try to like shred people in the comments like come on in my opinion it's like man like even the fact that the names that we desired were connected on some other it was just cool Mm -hmm. i thought it was cool i was like that's awesome um but yeah yeah so remade in misery is the name of our record and um that's a line from the song misery right which is really something that sums up the whole record for sure um, this record, you kind of had time for it. I mean, well, you obviously had time for it, but before the pandemic, wasn't mm-hmm. that the original plan to kind of just, we're going to take a little bit of time here between tours and focus on writing a record? Yeah, yeah. Um, we, you know, when the pandemic really first hit, we were not, w- okay, so we were supposed to be out on the road with this DJ named Kazo. Okay. That was something that got canceled for us, and it was like... I can't remember. I think it was only like seven shows or something like that, mm-hmm. but they were going to be sick. We had done one show with him in Houston and dude, he is so, he's so dope. That and sounds like such an interesting set. I mean, yeah. like, interesting. So his bill. whole thing is that he is like really paired up, you know, like rock and emo era music with, um, EDM and, and okay. created his own thing that way. It's like, it's amazing. He's so, he's so good. And his live show is crazy. His production's crazy. His crowd is so energetic. So like for us, he's just like a metalcore band. Like we came out and just like played a set before him and everyone was jumping. I mean, there's like 3,500 people there just like <laughs> going nuts. They came for like an EDM show, but we we're just giving them what we had. And it mm-hmm. was so cool. So we were like, let's definitely go out and do that, those shows. Um, and, uh, that was the first thing that hit. That was like really, really early on when everything started to kind of talk about getting canceled. Mm-hmm. And we got the word. They were like, ah, we can't do this. Um, and then after that, we were like, all right, let's dive in and let's make a record. Um, and we knew 
that we were going to be writing, but the whole plan for everything and how it came out, like single by single and stuff like that, all really came together during the pandemic. As we were writing the songs, we got into song four and song five and song six and song seven. And I was telling Rise, I was like, these all feel like singles to me. And mm-hmm. and, and that's not, it, 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 there's something in every one of these songs that feels important to my heart. And I can't stand the thought of putting out a record really fast, not being able to tour and having seven deep cuts that people mm-hmm. aren't going to hear because they weren't the singles. And I was like, can we just put this out one at a time? Uh-huh. You know, really want to do that, you know? And um, we knew there would be challenges with it. People being like, this is different. I don't like different. Right, right. Um, but but it worked. Um, it worked so amazingly well. And I don't know if that f- formula is would work the same if you weren't in a pandemic. I think people were hungry for music and live music wasn't happening as, as, as much, right? Mm-hmm. So by the time we were putting songs out it was just cool to like have something to look forward to every month because we weren't on the road right um if we were touring as much i don't know if that format makes as much sense but for this specific thing like it was a risk and i really wanted to take it and it paid off and i'm I'm really happy with how it turned out yeah Yeah. and i know we were talking about this last time with just like how people digest music nowadays it's like single you know yeah it's the single game but a band like memphis may fire doesn't necessarily need to do that Mm -hmm. i mean you have such a fan base you've put out six records at this point if you're a newer band it makes sense it's like okay i'm going to try to test the waters it's going to work and then these right. five songs are going to make an ep right but i love the way you guys did this though because yeah. all this it does give every song an opportunity to kind of have its moment totally yeah i think i think that it, we, there would have been focal singles had we done it in a regular album format people would have been like kind of latched onto these and only certain people would have gone and listened to the record front to back because it's mm-hmm. kind of rare that people even do that anymore, right? Right. Um, and so this was the way. This was the way that it needed to be. And, it, and gosh, man, I'm so glad to have had a you know a full year of just looking forward to putting out something every month. And it's been cool. How are you guys doing? Was Kellen writing the music and sending it to you? Or? Yeah, just I mean, just like we always have. Like as long as we've been a band, except for Broken. Um, which I think you can hear uh, if you listen to the record. But, you know, like as long as we've been a band, Kellen has always finished instrumental demos, send them to me. I'll write vocals over it. If we need to chop and edit and move stuff around for the, to complement the vocal, we will, but rarely do we mm-hmm. ever do that. Um, and, you know, that's how it's always been. Okay. Always. And so like pandemic writing style of like not being in person was like, cool. Yeah, we, no, didn't, didn't. We, we never did that anyways. Right, you know right. what I mean? I can't even imagine like me and Kellen <laughs> sitting down in a room like, how about this riff? And I'm like, how about this vocal? Like, okay. it's, that's like a movie in my head. <laughs> like that's not how it works in real life. Okay. Uh, so yeah. But this way, uh, you had Cody, who we've talked, he's yep. a good friend of yours. I've interviewed him before, met him a few times at your yeah, house. Yeah. He was coming over, right? Isn't, weren't you guys? Well, he was coming over on? every day, and anyway. no matter what. We, we hung out every <laughs> single day, dude. And, and he's just like such a special friend of mine. He's a great guy. Such a sweetheart. Um, lives out here in Spring Hill. We've gotten, we got so close over the pandemic because the only people that we were able to see were the people that were like right in our immediate community there Mm -hmm. that we saw every day. And that was Cody was there. And I, you know, Kellen and I were going to travel around and write with some people. And I was like, well, I'm, you know, I'm going to be here writing and Cody, would you want to write some songs with me? And the more we wrote together, the more we realized it just made sense to keep writing together on every one. It was so fun. And it was like, it was, you know, Cody is, has liked the band for a long time. Cody's been a fan of the band for a long time. So writing with him was like, it was literally like being able to be in in the in the studio with a with a Memphis fan and write a song and then be like, "This is what I wish was going to happen here." You oh, know what I mean? That's cool. And I was like, "Oh, cool!" You know, it's just it was so fun and and he's brilliant. I was going to say, coming from somebody that you probably respect as a musician, obviously, totally. Like it wasn't just some fan that doesn't know. Absolutely, how to write a song. <laughs> absolutely, yeah. And just respect as as like the heart. Cody and I are so similar in how we think and how we operate and how we interact that it was just like literally the same as like if you were like have have a buddy hey you want to come over and watch the game right so yeah you want to come over and write you know Uh and we just did and then we made a record so super cool so did he help you on like a majority of the songs on the album we wrote together on every song on the record really Um, it was there was some that were way more far along by the time he had come in Mm -hmm. and then some that were like empty when we started you know uh the first one that we had the first song that we wrote together was somebody and I think I had the chorus done um, and maybe a couple lyric changes that needed to happen in the chorus. I can't remember exactly where we were, but we came in, we just like vibed on the chorus 
started working on the verses, got that kind of like pop, like pre-chorus, like hooky thing in there. And we're like, this is really cool. It's unlike anything we've ever done. And finished up the demo, like actually cut the vocal and finished up a demo and sent it to everybody. And everyone's like, whoa. And I was like, okay, there's something really special about me and Cody doing this stuff together because he's bringing out the best in me. Mm -hmm. And it was, it was great. And so we did another one together and we were like, sick. And everyone's like, this is really sick. And then we did another one together and everyone's like, we're on fire. And I was like, all right, let's go, let's we're, go. Keep going. And, and there was a time when he had to leave to go finish their new record. And we had like 10 days leading up to that. And I was like, let's write every day for the next 10 days. So we just did. We just got a bunch of like snacks and drinks and hold up in the studio and yeah. just chilled and we'd celebrate at night every night, you know? <laughs> and you helped them on a song on their record as well. Yeah. Yeah. I wrote, um, I wrote with one of the, on, on their record. Cody's, I mean, by the time Cody does all the writing for wage, like by the time a song is done, it's usually like the vocal and everything is just on there. Right. Okay, like, yeah. so we'll hear songs and it's been like this for, for the last like few years where like, if we get a wage song, like an idea, it's a finished song. Okay. You know what I mean? Yeah, like yeah, yeah. You're, you're like, he's like, check out this idea I wrote today. And it's like, da -da 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 -da. it's like perfect. Yeah, and you're, you're just like, like whoa. <laughs> um, yeah. It's, it's always really sick. But, um, there is one that, that I, I think I, I wrote a chorus on and, and we were like, that's sick. Let's work on that. So I got to, to be on one. This is cool. So cool. Yeah. And thank you, Maddie, for coming to my house and yeah. doing this. Like this has been, your house rips. I appreciate. I that. like it better than mine. Nah, we got, we got to move over here. Dude. We got, it's only we got here. space, man. We're less than a mile, dude. Yeah, come yeah. on over. We got yeah. a third car you can park in. Yeah, let's go, dude. <laughs> I can park in the backyard. Park in the big, backyard. Dog. There you That's go. Awesome. Um, dude, thank you so much. Uh, I'm gonna ask you the same question I asked you last time, but I want to make one comment on uh, the on make believe. I love like the glitching yeah. on the vocal. Like, who's who, were you guys like like did Kellen do the production on it? Like. Yeah, Kellen did. So um, we had, while tracking demo vocals, me and Cody had some ideas for vocal production that he would bring to life in the best way that we could just okay. with what we were doing in the moment. And then I tracked vocals with Cameron Mizell, and we did some production that was kind of like, ext it became like extended demo production. Uh -huh. And then once it was time for the whole record to come together, Kellen actually built everything from dry. Okay. Um, and so some of it remained the same. Some of it became kind of Kellen's own flavor and some of it changed completely. Um, so yeah, it was, but, uh, but the glitching thing, I think that Cody and I just, we did that in the moment, okay. like right when we wrote that part. It sounds and so like, sick. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was really cool. Um, I mean like glitch and that kind of stuff has just been around forever like in our genre of music but mm -hmm. that part and the story that it told right there it like makes so much sense yeah like the glitchy vocal thing i think is dead and has been dead for a long time like what was happening so much in like 2012 and 13 right. and 14 but it's not that but you executed that part, it like brilliantly yeah it's not that it, in that part it's very much it's very much uh needed right like it was like this is this digital like this like you know kind of lucid like digital world that like needs to be seen and felt and tasted through this part um and the music video does a great job at kind of showcasing yeah, that it's too, amazing so. well, okay man again so much respect and thank you so much for doing this yeah first time i've actually spoken with someone in person dude, for that's two so, years that's so thing. awesome i'm stoked for you dude you should be doing this a lot more well, i will hopefully yeah. so um last question if you have any advice for aspiring artists yeah definitely um this isn't easy, you know, <laughs> like, um, I think that like the most loving and most direct thing that I can say to any new artist is don't waste your time. If you're not really in, if you're not all in, just don't even waste your time. You're going to, you're going to end up with heartbreak. You know, I get that question all the time. Like, how do I, I want to do music full time. Like, how do I, and I'm just like, if you want to do music full time, do music full time. Mm-hmm. Like literally live on someone's floor, sleep in someone's closet, you know, um, buy a van, take out a loan, buy a trailer. If you think that you're writing songs that people will love and utilize and, and be changed by, you know, like go and do it, do everything you can do. Take every single risk that there is, because if you don't, someone else is going to, mm -hmm. There are people that want this enough to be 33 years old and still chasing the dream, right? Mm -hmm. So if you don't, then then don't waste your time. You know, there's so many so many life paths out there that you can be happy with. Um, obviously, music and doing it full time is such a gift. Don't waste your time if you're not all in. And and um, 
And if you don't want to do music full time, but you just love music and you just want to put music out, that's awesome too. You know what I mean? Like, don't feel like a million streams has to happen every time you put out a song. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it can just be about the music and that's amazing. And the one person that hears it, it, you know, helps them and that's enough. That's amazing. Uh, but yeah, if you want to do this full time, like strap on your boots, dude. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. It's that. a wild ride. Thank you so much, Maddie. You're yeah. amazing. Thank, Thank you so you. much. Bring